Welcome to My Fitness Ride, a podcast dedicated to developing a healthier mindset for a better life. Each week, we'll share insights, experiences, and tools with the intention of helping you build a better vision for your health and fitness. Hello, and welcome to My Fitness Ride podcast with Dr. Chris Lutere, who is visiting us to talk about many issues amongst them, burnout, money, mindset, and non-clinical careers for physicians. So this episode is going to be devoted to my colleagues mostly, but then again, you have to realize that these definitions and concepts we'll be talking about not only apply to physicians, but also to anybody in the clinical workplace, nurses, you know, CNAs. And then again, I will dare to go even further, not only to people in healthcare, it applies to everybody. I think uh, burnout has become something that's in every single profession and maybe not even every single profession, every single walk of life. Single mothers get burnt out, get burnt out, and understandably so. You know, I, I like to say that that's probably the most underestimated non-profession. Single mothers, teachers. So I suggest everybody, you know, tune in, and then we'll have a nice talk about these topics. But first of all, I want to introduce you to my friend, Dr. Chris Liu. Hey, hey, Rafael. I'm great to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me. No, man, thank you. And uh, I met Chris about 10 months ago now in December. And when I met him at first, actually, I didn't realize we were at a personal development seminar. And, you know, we, we met and we, we, you know, we participated, et cetera. And I met, actually found out you were a physician like a month after we left when we connected on Facebook. And to my surprise, you were not, not only a physician, but you were an orthopedic residency. And I think you graduated, right? And then you retired. Is that how it went? I'll, I'll get into the story later. I was uh, I did two years of orthopedic residency, and then I decided this was at the height of the OA financial crisis. I decided to get out of that and start my real estate investing company, and then uh, built that. Retired in 2016. You know that's when I started getting into all of this personal development and uh, self development. And that's where I you know met you and Tony Robbins, Oprah, and all of that. And that's when I decided to launch my freelance consulting company, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. Cool. All right. Well, tell us who is Dr. Chris Liu. Grew up in Houston. And then uh, since this is a self-development podcast, you know, it's going to be a lot of vulnerability, share a lot, be a very authentic to you. So throughout life, success was always my mask. So a lot of people have different masks, but for me, it was always achievement. So I got a full scholarship to undergrad. Then I went to a Baylor for medical school, which was uh, back then, which was a uh, solid tier one medical school, part of the MD PhD program. So what that meant was that you got a full scholarship to medical school, which is very unheard of if you did three to four years of research. So uh, got a PhD in bioengineering at Rice University. So to make up for that time, I decided to start my entrepreneurial venture. So one company was in real estate, the other one was in stocks. And by the age of 29, was able to generate a full-time income without needing a job or working for anybody. And this will come into the uh, section where we talk about wealth mindsets and things that hold you back and people's relationship with money. So a couple of uh, realizations in terms of the wealth and abundance mindsets. One is as an entrepreneur, I was getting paid for the value that you're able to deliver and the ability to see markets, opportunities, and capitalize them on them was huge. And the thing is, in contrast to a traditional job, a lot of these opportunities are emerging. So you have to really be aware of them. You have to see them coming so that you'll be able to capitalize on them. Some of them are long-lived, some of them are short-lived, and just some of them you have to see that a lot of industries are in decline. And then the second realization was that my real passion was in uh, starting, creating companies, getting them up and running, and then moving on to the next thing. That was just innate in me. That was always ingrained in me. So if I could become highly skilled at seeing opportunities and capitalize them, then I wouldn't really need a job anymore in the future. So I, I really honed in on developing that skill set and becoming the best at that. And then the third thing was my love of technology. So I integrated that love of technology with medicine. So I saw that technology was leveling the playing field 
was demolishing barriers. So it was allowing average people like you and me to enter existing markets and industries. And so the implication of that is huge because in the past, you had to always adhere to a traditional pathway. You had to you know, run the rat race, run in the corporate world. And that just wasn't me. That didn't flow my boat. So with technology, you could actually no longer have to rely on traditional methods to make it uh, in society today. Nevertheless, a lot of pressure to finish medical training, go out and practice medicine. That was from my um, you know, society, parents, my wife. So I finished med school, matched into an orthopedic residency, like we said, did two years. But then it really, it really wasn't like Tony was saying is a lot of it was uh, a success mask. So I was just masking, you know, all of my insecurities and fears, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. Back in 08, it was the height of the crisis. And I was just really unhappy, really unfulfilled in my career. And this was like prime opportunity. And my intuition told me to just take a leap of faith. You start a real estate investing company, um, and that's what I did. I, I just each each year I invested in pieces of real estate throughout Houston and um, grew it to the point of being able to retire in 2016. After that, I took a year off, and then uh, just I started studying a lot of spirituality, self development, trying to really align instead of focusing on success, more focus on growth and fulfillment. And that's when I ran into leaders like Tony Robbins, Wayne Dyer, Deepak, and Oprah. And that's where we met as well. Yeah. And then that's when I decided what the next phase of my life would be, which was to be, to grow, to contribute, to be more fulfilled rather than just chasing money. So I launched my freelance consulting companies, which I speak, written three books. I'm on my fourth one now, which is in editing. And now I, my clients, I help with as an executive coach both in like business strategy and career transitions. That's my entire story. And this executive coaching, basically what you're trying to do is guide your clients in um, transitioning to yeah. non-clinical careers or is it just overall business? Well, the executive coaching, a lot of my um, clients, well, I have one segment my clients are um, physicians. So the one is like the very early ones who are just trying to, because a career transition is a huge transition. So they're trying to prepare themselves. So a lot of them are still, they're still in their current roles and they're just looking for somebody who's seen the pathway to show them, you know, all the pitfalls, all of the yeah. challenges, and how to navigate that. So that's one segment. And I usually, that's usually like more watered down. It's an online, a lot of times it's group coaching. And then I have another segment who's actually transitioned out. So they've already started, they've launched their companies, they launched their business, they launched their other careers. And that's ones where I do private coaching. So that's a lot of business strategy and a lot of branding, positioning, and how to leverage and launch their brand as well as how to protect it so they can flourish in their companies. It sounds to me like you have a lot of clients and I'm, I, I mean, I'm sure because obviously, you know, I'm a doctor too. And I know me and my colleagues, a lot of us, you know, we usually talk about what other options there may be, you know, other than what we do. And it's interesting to, I was listening to um, this guy, C-Dog MD, the guy that does all the videos on social media, I was listening, you know, to Athena Health podcast, they were talking about burnout. And it's funny that there's like, 50% of physician, physicians approximately think, or maybe even more, I would say that there's no other option than, you know, that you're basically stuck in what you do because that's what you trained for. But I also know that you have another opinion regarding that. Yeah, I think that's a really a limited mindset. I talk a lot about that with coaches or my clients. I mean, clinical medicine is really, that's, it's really a highly niche specific skill set. And one thing that it is, is that the landscape of healthcare is changing. So one is it pays well, but the fulfillment is going down and the time and energy is going up and the stress levels are going up. So that's one niche. The thing is that a lot of my clients, they say their future is over because they left clinical medicine. But I, a lot of it is they're shooting themselves in the foot before it actually happens because the rest of the opportunities, I mean, you can go out there, you know, if you know how to 
use the internet, if you know how to use social media, if you know how to speak, if you have a network, if you have your niche, your niche skill set, you have a particular skill set that you're very highly skilled at. So for example, mine was in starting companies, either in generating income that way. You can actually, if you're as a consultant, you can actually make more as an entrepreneur and be more happy and more fulfilled than as a practicing physician. So I tell, and, and again, I think that idea is, is just ingrained in us because, you know, as physicians, you know, we're charged with patient care and with the well-being of humanity and society. So I think a lot of us, you know, we come in with good intentions, but, you know, when those intentions don't really serve us anymore, it's time to move on. And so you have to really get rid of that mindset and you have to sort of take a leap of faith and sort of just immerse yourself and allow yourself to go through the process. I think, you know, the limited mindset that you mentioned, obviously, um, this is my passion is mindset in everything. And the limited mindset, I think, comes from basically the way we're trained, you know, and, and the way not only that we're trained, but how we get to where we are. You know, the, the most of us are, you know, obviously, we have to be a little bit, at least a little bit intelligent, you know, types <laughs> of personalities driven. And uh, when we get to a point of being trained, in a residency program, like you know, most of us are, basically we get indoctrined into behavior of following, you know, kiss the ring, this is our leader, our attending, and we have to be obedient and do what they tell us to do. And so that then eventually you're the one who is in charge and you're the attending and so on and so forth. And you have to follow the rules. And, you know, there, there's a, a certain limitation that's ingrained into our minds that this is what we do. And this is all that we're capable of when in reality, you know more than I do that there's many other things out there, which I've just recently started to learn by listening, looking at your books and looking at what you're doing, you know, and, and it's really fascinating when you can switch that limited mindset from, you know, this is it, I'm in the hospital, there's nothing else for the rest of my life to really see uh-huh. the options and that every single person, whether they know it or not, has a set of talents and skills that, you know, definitely can be used for whatever it is they want to do, you know? Actually, now that I think about it, you know, some of my colleagues, I have a great group of colleagues in my, in my nocturnist work that I do uh, here locally, and uh, we have a great time at work, you know, at, wow. in, in our little office, although we might be really stressed and busy, we have wow. a great time joking around. And I can tell you for sure that some of the things we come up with could be cool stories, you know, cool articles or whatever. So, Sometimes we just focus so much on the limitations we have, like we're doctors and this is what we do, and we don't open ourselves up to, for example, why not write the, the things we talk about, why, why not write articles or do social media, whatever you want to do and get the, that message or that content out there. And you know, who knows, eventually it may become a thing. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. It's all in the mindset and what you make of it. So personally, back in 08, with my medical career to launch my company, Everybody thought I was throwing away my future. Everybody thought I was crazy. But if you fast forward 11 years later, I tell everybody that that decision to start my investment company was one of the best decisions I've made in my life, period. Mm -hmm. It was just hands down. That was like the best decision that I've ever made in my entire life. So I worked really hard for 10, 11 years, but I was able to enjoy the, you know, the remaining 30, 40, you know, God willing plus years of my life. So, so let me ask you, when you decided to quit, when you were in the um, ortho training, was it because you felt burnt out? I mean, you, you already shared with us that you felt unfulfilled, but how about, you know, feeling like you were burnt out? Is that something that you were going through? Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked, asked that question. You know, how does all of this relate to burnout? So uh, I think burnout is an interesting concept because on the surface level, I, I hear a lot, you know, I'm, I'm burnt out, especially physicians, I'm so burnt out. So that's surface level, right? A lot of times, all they need is a vacation. Sometimes they need six months off, maybe just a sabbatical. And sometimes they really, they, need, they really need a career change. So you have to really look at the underlying patterns and mechanisms, what's causing them to say, I'm, I'm so burnt out. And sometimes it's just better strategies, mechanisms for dealing with the daily stressors. Sometimes maybe it may just be a lateral shift into more research or more teaching or administration, you know, something more strategic. A lot of times we equate burnout with a career, but it can happen in any area of our lives. I think it's just the sign that something needs to change and something's not right. So 
I think burnout is a, is a symptom and it's a part of an overall bigger picture. For example, it can manifest in relationships, marriage, family, career, and health. And the thing is, if you don't, if you don't address burnout, then what happens is that it just festers and, yeah. it, and it festers and it's going to grow and grow and grow to the point where you know, we have the typical or the stereotypical midlife crisis. That's what usually happens. And, but the thing is, you have to look at it in terms of what the core of what we're talking about is just the total package. So what Maslow talked about was being self-actualized. So you want to be have this physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So especially in a medical career, you know, you, you're compensated well financially, but are you really fulfilled on the physical, emotional, and spiritual level? So that's really at the heart of what we're talking about. I, I agree with what you're saying. I think there's uh, many things, you know, I mean, I, I like what you describe as a surface level talking about burnout, but deep down, you know, when you're mentioning really not being fulfilled and maybe needing a sabbatical or whatever, I think the, the, the deep down level that you're mentioning equates to a moral injury when, like we were saying earlier, you train for so many years. I mean, we internal medicine do three years. You were going to do five if you were able to, you know, if you were to finish, you would have done five. Some people in you know, neurosurgeons do seven. And the moral injury, I think, comes from a place where you, face, you come out and face the real world. You know, you finish your training. You are this young guy, girl, doctor, whoever you are. You have these ideologies and these dreams of contributing and helping people, but then you <laughs> come out to the real world, real world, and you uh, you know get that big punch in the face uh, if that things are not the way you thought they would be. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it, it, you can bring it down to the fact that you know there's many things. Number one is I think you will like this because you work in technology, and you were in the whole process of bringing in the electronic health records. I think to a certain point, these electronic health records have in some ways isolated us, at least in me and my, as a hospitalist. And I, I do locum work. So I've been seven, I've worked at 17 hospitals. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them, the fact that we have this EMR, you don't even have to talk to another doctor because you see their notes and you just consult them and you never talk to them. Sometimes you don't even need to communicate with a nurse because you can do a nurse communication. So sometimes you just see patients and then you spend the rest of the day locked out in a, in a computer, isolated. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is that some people I've heard mention this, and like my good friend, Dr. Chris Ams, I'm going to shout him out, was saying to me the other day, we become box clickers, you know, <laughs> with the EMR. We're clicking boxes just to get more RVUs and, you know, click on the smoking cessation counseling. And it's a glorified cash register. And in, yeah. in, in time, in time, anybody will get burnt out because you're not serving your true purpose or calling of what you came to do, which is spend time with the patient. And that's another thing. All these things compound into you have to see a patient in five minutes <laughs> and you don't even get to talk to them more or, you know, have a connection. And in yeah. the end, one of the biggest gratifying factors, and, and you probably know this, from all of these things that I'm mentioning, all these injuries or whatever you want to call them, is when a patient's family member or the patient himself says, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing for me, what you're helping us. That means no. so much. People don't understand that. And that comes few far between in all these patients. So no wonder people are getting burnt out, you know, at a surface <laughs> level, at a deeper level. Yeah, you brought up a lot of interesting points, especially, you know, a lot of times, some of my best moments in medicine was when the, uh, when the patient, they came in, they were just so appreciative and, yeah. you know, just thanking you for what you did for them and their family. And like I said, I, I saw that that sort of appreciation, you know, dwindling just because the, it's not because of the patient or the, I think it's just the frustration with the healthcare system, but it's really those small, tiny moments where those appreciation, the gratitude that make the career rewarding. And I was seeking that sort of appreciation and, and fulfillment in another area where, where I could contribute my skills and my, my skill set. And so I could be, rewarded for my inherent creativity and things that I produced, you know, rather than being in a system and working that way. But it, it's funny that you mentioned that because I also tell my, all my clients, I love medical school. I was like, I was really gung ho. I was like, I thought I was fulfilling my dream. I, you know, I'm, I got into medical school and then uh, I loved, I love grad school. 
And I was actually excited about doing residency. And then they want a residency. I go to orientation and I'm just like, oh my God, they have us walking through the hospital and I'm just like, oh my God, this is the real world, you know? So this, that's when you get your, your moment of clarity is like, am I going to, do I really want to be doing this for the rest of my life? So, Especially in ortho, trauma, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's hardcore, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, literally I was working 120 hour work weeks and a lot of times staying up 40 plus hours straight. So, you know, it does, it, takes a toll on you. You have to really be in it for the, the love of it, you know, and you, at the heart of it, I think in terms of just when pursuing a career, I think at the heart of everything, studying Tony and everything is just, it's everybody, it's about self-esteem, unconditional love, meaning and growth and fulfillment. So a lot of people, sometimes that means for a family, for a spouse or doing good for some people, it's a career. And we have a lot of these underlying patterns. So, and it plays down in everyday life. For example, people pleasing, narcissism, addiction, personality disorders, mental disorders. But what I love about people like you and uh, Tony and o is that they channel all of their anger, pain into creating these powerful meanings that somehow allows them to transcend the victim mode and create beauty from their ashes. So yeah. we can yeah. take the same lesson and teachings and do the same thing. So. By studying all of this, I, I saw that a lot of the underlying patterns, both the mental, emotional habits. So we always think about negative or maladaptive patterns. You know, for example, drugs, sex, addiction, all of these maladaptive patterns, right? But we don't really look at it in terms of the. Sometimes even positive habits can become maladaptive. So, for example, like I was referring to, my my mask was success, and I was always chasing success, and I was chasing in the rewards and accolades. And I was doing that by being addicted to work, just always working, working, working. So in a sense, you know, work is an addiction, workaholic. And that can also be maladaptive. It can show up in your in your marriage, your relationships, your health, your everything. So, you know, you so you have the both sides. So you have these patterns, you have these skill sets, and you have these habits. So a lot of times you have to look at what's driving the underlying habits are you running away from something are you chasing something or are you doing something for your purpose and your meaning in your life so that's the main thing i got from tony and all of these um, self-help coaches yeah you know fulfillment and progress equals happiness that you know if you're not making progress or getting better you won't feel fulfilled which is actually you know that's why i I too am a workaholic and maybe I still am. And some sometimes I'm just doing it as a means of hiding and, you know, just being away from society yeah. to some point, because you know that when you're doing 12 hour shifts, seven days a week, you, you're not, you know, you're, you're in a bubble. You're, you're not living basically because you, you know, I mean, that's a decision you make. And I've been there a lot of times, not anymore in reality, after I've learned all these things that have helped me come out of that. Uh, burnout, but burnout definitely, you know, is a reality and moral injury, but definitely we won't leave it at that because we want to talk about ways to counteract it. Now, something that really gets me a little bit upset is the, you know, physicians, nurses included, and, you know, healthcare workers are people that are very strong minded and people that have been through a lot and have to go through a lot to get to where they are at that moment. And it really gets to me when healthcare systems, hospitals, administrations say to a healthcare provider, well, you have to be more resilient or you have to be able to bounce back a little bit better. You know what? I don't think there's anybody, any other profession in the world, doctors and nurses that are more resilient. You go through a 12 hour shift dealing with so much shit all night. Family members are upset. Patients are dying. Patients are sick. And then you come back the next day all over again and do it again. That's just an anecdote. The, the training, everything. So resiliency is not an issue. And then the other thing is they try to get you every now and then to do some mindfulness retreats, et cetera. But yeah. I think in the end, to get over this, you know, I mean, obviously there's people that really do need professional help and they need therapy and they need psychologists, et cetera. Or maybe even like you said before, a career change, but that's something we'll talk about in a minute. There's a few things that are very important to keep at the base and it's difficult sometimes, but you have to learn to be a little bit grateful for what you have. At least for me, it works because sometimes I'm like, I never want to do this again. I'm going to leave tomorrow. I'm never coming back. Recently, I was uh, joking with my friends that I'm going to declare chapter 11 and I'm just going to go back home and not work again. 
But in reality, when that's, <laughs> you joke around saying that, but in the end, you know, you have to be grateful for the fact that, you know, you were able to have a professional training and you have a job, you have a means of providing for your family. You have to learn to appreciate all the things that the good things that you can do, you know, even if you didn't get that, that appreciation from the family members or the patients, or maybe not, you don't get it. You probably won't get it from the hospital system or your, your employer. You could do it for yourself. You can appreciate what you're doing every day and the, the opportunity that you get to do it. There's another thing that I think is very powerful that is not often talked about is the fact that we as healthcare workers, I mean, it's a difficult proposition, but, you know, unifying in making these changes. I mean, there's, there's certain things that you could do that are small changes that can change a, a, a workplace environment. Like, for example, I mentioned earlier isolation. Although the isolation comes from maybe the EMR and the way it works, I mean, you could have morning meetings in, in the lounge. You know, you can have a lounge where people go and have lunch. You can have, a, I don't know, some kind of get together after work to discuss plans to make the hospital better. And I don't know, may, maybe give a little bit more leverage to the healthcare workers' opinions and input as far as to make things better. I'm sure that, you know, it sounds like a, like a utopic dream, but, you know, if healthcare providers and workers get all together yeah. to propose changes, I think it's something that hospital systems and insur even insurance companies would listen to, you know, but the, unfortunately, and I'll let you talk now, right now we're being driven politics, politics, <laughs> politics, politics, you know, that's, that's what it is. And the press too, you know, chips in every now and then with, with their opinions, which are <laughs> founded on, I don't know what they're founded on. They're not you know, real. I think since uh, managed care took over, um, I think in the 90s, it was great to be a physician. It was like, I think it was very rewarding, you know, back then. But I think once managed care took in and just like you said, just political interests, you know, very lot of business, they basically turned medicine into essentially a, a business for the insurance and um, for the uh, lawyers. But like you were saying, it just, you can talk about the frustrations and, you know, all of the dysfunction, but, but, but if you focus on just appreciation and, you know, gratitude, you know, we live in. USA and there's just so much opportunity and you just you just have to be able to see it and there's no nobody holding you back except yourself you know a lot of countries you know you don't even have this sort of opportunity you don't have the freedom to to be able to speak your mind and so you know, we yeah. have that so it's, it's really good to be grateful and appreciative you know we live in a we have one running water food shelter overhead so the rest is what you make of it you know Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. And we take yeah. it for granted so often, and it's true. Now, yeah. <laughs> having, having said that, we talked about gratitude, appreciation, all these things, and there, there's many more uh, things that could be done as far as mindset you know, changes and, and behaviors uh, to, to deal with burnout. But this person, let's do, we have an imaginary person here with us, and he's burnt out. He doesn't care anymore. He's not grateful for anything. He doesn't want to get better. He's done. He says, you know what? I'm done with this job. I'm done with the hospital. I'm done with the clinic. I'm done. I'm done. And the, the, and it's funny because I just mentioned it before. I'm joking around with my colleagues. I'm saying I'm going to declare bankruptcy and I'm not going to pay any of my debts and I'm just going to go back home and sell clothing or something. But that's, that's yeah. the limited mindset we talked about earlier because me, that, and I'm, I'm saying that, I was saying that these past few days, I know you can teach and there's some other jobs you can do, but I didn't realize that there's a big market for non-clinical careers. And that's what your last book is about, right? You want to tell us a little bit about this last book? Yeah. So my most recent book is uh, talking about how to start and flourish as a freelance consultant. So uh, the book starts off talking about the advantages and disadvantages of a freelance consulting career. But I think really the meat of it is how to position yourself as a freelance consultant. So a lot of that is related to branding and marketing. So how to position your brand as, as a very strong one and how to use, for example, leverage technology, for example, such as social media, networking, public speaking, authorship, those sort of things to enhance your brand and and so that you're in position so that you can leverage and capitalize on niche consulting opportunities. And once you successfully launch your brand, so for example, you yourself, you're doing this podcast and you're, you know, you're transitioning out of a career in clinical medicine as well. So I, you know, you're sort of positioning yourself and you're, you're growing that subscriber base 
and then how to use technology to protect your brand and also to enhance your brand. So that's that was my third book. Really, it, it came out of my very first book. I wanted to write about my experiences from growing up, all of my motivations, you know, through residency, and then being able to retire. That was that was my autobiography, and I essentially thought that was the end of my story, but. The entrepreneur in, in me just wanted wanted to do, always always looking for the next thing and for the next opportunity. So, and how can I grow and how can I expand and what can I make out of this? So, my next thing was to write books about each of the different companies that I had started. And so, one was just book writing was creative to be able to create something and produce something. So that was highly enjoyable. And then the other thing was just to give back and contribute my knowledge and experience and expertise. Um, so what people who are interested in this sort of field can always you know, go on the Amazon online bookstore and you know, look at these books and books are always there. So it's more of an extension and leverage of myself. I should have probably asked you this before you started, but what exactly is a freelance consultant? So a freelance consultant is essentially, it's an entrepreneur who has a, highly specific skill set or he can be skilled he or she can be skilled in a variety of areas essentially going out and marketing and branding him or herself as an expert in a particular field so for example me myself um, i'm a physician right but i'm also i'm an entrepreneur at heart i'm an investor and so what i do is i i leverage that experience for example one avenue of the freelance consulting business is in technology and healthcare so that was what we were talking about being a consultant with a lot of the hospitals implementing electronic health records, right? And it's sort of transitioning into technology, healthcare technology startups that are focused on medical devices, uh, applications, things to streamline the whole field of medicine or to provide a particular value or service to a particular niche, right? The third aspect of the company is more of a, as a, coach and as a strategist and as one who has an expert. So that's through speaking, writing, and coaching. Those are the those three things. So you can brand leverage and a lot of it, you know, like that's, a, that's, that's the creative part is it can actually take you anywhere in the income potential is, is unlimited. It's just, it depends on, you know, how skilled you are at marketing, speaking, networking, things like that. So when you mentioned branding and leverage, this is the part where we're talking about a specific skill set? Yeah. So, for example, for branding, so things to enhance your brand, public speaking, writing books, consulting, doing these podcasts, having your own YouTube channel, social media. So that's that's the, the branding part, right? The leverage part is how you're going to essentially gain more by utilizing the resources around you. For example, you can start your own blog, you can start your own YouTube channel, your Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. The second step is to partner with other people through affiliates. The other thing is, for example, doing this podcast with you, doing guest interviews. All of those help to leverage yourself. So you're, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's a win-win. We're producing this content. We're giving a lot of value. And, you know, in terms, it's, it's enhancing our brand as well. So that's the leverage part. So I'm always looking towards, you know, how can you expand and grow and how can you share and give and contribute more? So, so this is one avenue of, you know, non-clinical careers would be more of an artistic uh, contribution with developing content. What other kinds of, you know, for, for, for a physician listening out there that's sitting and wondering, you know, what could I do? What can I offer? In a non-clinical world, what kind of you know jobs would you say? I mean, that you know that are that are out there. Literally, the the sky's the limit. So some of my coaching clients, they uh, they do uh, disability chart reviews at home. They do reviews for insurance companies. A lot of them, they love the legal world, so a lot of them are expert witnesses. They get you know, they get paid a lot to be expert witnesses. Some of them are technical writers write for scientific journals. Some of them are sort of like the media. They cover scientific events, writing. A lot of them are in pharma, so they can 
be consultants for big pharma, for the FDA, for the VA. Essentially, like I said, the sky's the limit if you are able to just hone in and see different opportunities. I think what catches a lot of physicians is that we're placed on this path where it's just, you know, you do medical school, you do residency, you do fellowship, you know, you get your job, but they're, we're not really trained to see the different niches and the different opportunities that are all around us within the healthcare field. So I think that's a lot of it where it comes from, where, you know, we think that patient care is the only thing to do. And this applies to nurses too. I, I keep mentioning nurses, but it's because I have a high respect for them. Shout out to all the nurses who may be listening. You know, I, I, that's my favorite profession. I can sum it all down to, I spend 10 minutes with the patient, they spend 12 hours. So, you know, big shout out to every nurse, nurse that, is, that could be listening. It's all very interesting, brand leverage, different professions. I know you mentioned big pharma. I think one interesting one that could, I don't know if it exists or not, but we were talking about burnout, you know, consultants with regards to avoiding burnout. Because I think sometimes the people that are doing this are not clinical people, are not doctors. They're bringing in somebody with a business degree or something to help come up with tools to battle burnout. But, you know, I think you should probably bring in somebody from the clinical world. I think that'd be probably interesting. However, having said that, what would you um, recommend to people that are listening, physicians, nurses, healthcare providers that are thinking, you know, one year from now, two years from now, five years from now, tomorrow, to leave whatever career they're in and transition into a non-clinical role? So I think a lot of it, and again, yeah, shout out to all the nurses because they're the front lines. And, you know, a lot of my best experiences in the medical profession was nurses. A lot of what I learned, what they, they taught me. So shout out to that. But I think you start out with adopting a wealth mindset. So I think like mindset is the is the key. And I think I think from in society, I think society we're actually programmed to be poor. And I don't think that's it may be intentional, it may not be. A lot of it's, you know, marketing. But I think especially from this, this early age, from schools and the media, I think we were programmed with a life is supposed to be like a Disney World fairy tale. So we're, you know, we're there's supposed to be a straight line. We're supposed to get a job, go to school, get a job, you know, work for 50 years, get married, have kids, live in a nice neighborhood, drive cars, et cetera, you know, take vacations. And I think a lot of the, you know, Western, where we live in a capitalistic society and where a lot of our significance and is, is derived from, you know, we're supposed to strive and we're supposed to achieve and we're supposed to accumulate. I think that's just ingrained in our culture, but a lot of times our relationship with with money as well so you know that's that comes from our upbringing and our habits so a lot of it has to be one you have to have have a wealth mindset so one place to start out is to start looking at instead of shooting yourself in the foot is to start thinking about all of the different opportunities that are around you and start to see how you can capitalize on that and then the other thing is where you have to factor in time. In a traditional sense, I think we're trained to just focus on income, focus on income, you know, get a, get a good job, you know, make a lot of money. But I think you have to look at it in terms of the time, the opportunity cost, you know, are you, are you really free or you, you have to be there all the time or are you able to you know, travel the world and do your job, you know, be very mobile? And you also have to factor in, you know, fulfillment and meaning. Does this, does this really resonate with you? It's not just, you know, you make a million million dollars a year because if that's costing your, your health and your family and your marriage and your, you know, it's, it's really not worth it. The other thing is, uh, is money is an idea. It's Money isn't really, it's just an idea. For a lot of people, their mindset is money is time, which kind of makes sense. You know, you have to really value your time. But I think for a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs and artists and creatives, you know, money is an idea. So it's all about growth. It's all about opportunity. It's all about learning. It's all about connection. So for an entrepreneur, I'm always focused on assets. I'm not really focused on the, the money. I'm just focused on, is this a good asset that'll produce income, residual income? So, you know, whereas, you know, mainstream, they're thinking, oh, what is my yearly salary? that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a totally different mindset. And the one thing is 
studying really, really super, super successful, wealthy individuals, it just comes down to mindset. It's how they view the world, how they see things and the way they do things. It's, it's just sometimes you just talk to them. It's just they're coming from a different frame. That to me is just so fascinating. I've always struggled with uh, with this mindset in particular because obviously as a kid, you're always told money doesn't grow on trees or you have to work really hard for money. And to a certain point, they ingrain to your brain that you have to suffer for money. Yeah. You have to exchange your time, work hard and bust your back to get any kind of money. And now, yeah. you know, when you think about listening to you talk about investing and real estate, it stresses me out a bit. I won't lie because I immediately associated with a struggle. I associated uh-huh. with hard work and sleepless nights and to a certain point, like suffering. And that doesn't have to be true. As a matter of fact, that's not true. It could be something that's enjoyable. I mean, when you're doing real estate investing or starting a company, you know, obviously you, you, will, you will work hard. There's always work involved, but it doesn't have to be suffering. It could actually be an enjoyable thing. And the other thing is when you mention money as an idea, or as uh-huh. some people like to call it energy, it's a fascinating concept to me. I, I won't lie to you. I'm still learning it. And it's something I'll continue to, to, you know, to get educated on. But I can see it, though. I can see it with, when they mention the, the you know, moniker adding value. Because the, the fact that you, for example, you write these books and you're doing it as a service, which is another key word in, the, in this money business, you know, service and adding value, you're doing this as a service to other physicians or people who are seeking to learn how to do real estate, for example. And in, in adding that value, in turn, it turns into money. You get an, an income, you get speaking gigs as a speaker. You know, that's the part that's a little bit difficult to understand. For me, at least, you know, every day I get a little better at it. So eventually I'll get it. But I think that's, that's kind of like the point, right? What do you think? No, I, 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 I totally agree. I think um, after getting into personal development, I just like I consider myself just a little baby in this in this space because I just have so much areas that I need to continue to grow in and continue to learn in and just continue to grow and develop and evolve as a, as a human. I totally agree with you. When you talked about what are your underlying messages about money growing up, for example, money doesn't grow on trees or, you know, things like the rich are greedy or the, you know, the rich are, um, those really shape your ideas because, or, you know, you have to, of course you have to work or, you know, you have to work hard for money and, you know, things, all these messages, you know, compound. And I think it really, it really sets us up to re- not really succeed, but more just sort of get by and really not focus on, you know, just the opportunities there. So, and again, it's a stepwise process, you know, you have to work hard to, to land your, your job, but, you know, it's really all about how you're generating that income. So, you know, that income can be through a job, it can be through a business, it can be through an investment. And it's all about, you know, how you leverage that. So, you know, you have your finances, your expenses. The key here is you want to be able to generate income without sacrificing your time. So you don't, that's the key is that's how you attain your financial freedom is you're able to generate enough value to produce income, either through assets or you know, your Service. particular time. Skills. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. So once you get your financial freedom, then the sky's the limit. You know, you can, you know, you can choose what you want to do. So for example, my initial vehicle was medicine, right? So that was generating income. But then the next vehicle was starting and investing in companies. And that's more of a, you know, wealth. And then, you know, once you achieved wealth, then it's like, what's the next thing? So that's fulfillment and growing and contributing. So that's why I started the freelance consulting business, right? So I think I think we touched on the points we wanted to touch on, but before I finish up, there's something I wanted to ask you, and it's let's imagine Christopher Liu sold all of his companies, and now he's a billionaire. He doesn't need to work anymore. He bought an island in the Bahamas after the hurricane, and uh, he's going to move there with his family. He's going to live there forever and ever, no social media. He's just going to disappear until the day that he dies and just live his best life. And nah. before you go and you get on that private jet that you're going to get on to go to the Bahamas, you have three pieces of advice or however many you want to give to those of us who are still planning or attempting to make that career change. What would you tell us? Well, one is uh, 
do what you really love. So today's there's no shortage of opportunities. There's no barriers. With technology, you can start a company for free using a laptop, smartphone, and internet connection. So follow your passions. That's one thing. The other thing is really be true to yourself. Don't hide from all of these masks. Just, you know, go out there, be vulnerable, be authentic, be you. There's going to be a certain segment of the population that's, you know, that's going to not like you. But then the more real and authentic you are, the more you're going to draw people that are really true to you. And then um, the third thing is find out what skill set that you can be the best in the world that that can that will separate you from the rest of the pack that will make you stand out. So you identify that one skill set and you hone in on that and you become the best in the world at that. And you don't get distracted by what other people are saying or what other people are doing or other people's success or all of that. I think you're on your way to really just long lasting fulfillment, growth and happiness, which is, you know, that's, that's what we all want is just to be happy, loved and have a high positive self-concept. Yes, sir. Dr. Christopher Lou, thank you so much for, for taking the time today and preparing so well for this. I really appreciate it. I know that um, you provide a service as a coach for, you know, in, in, in this, how do we contact you? If, if any of us wants to, you know, work with you or, or start at least to know how to start moving with regards to this. The easiest way, uh, look me up on uh, LinkedIn. So you just type in my name, Christopher H. Lou. And then you can also look me up on Instagram on Dr. Chris Lou, MD, PhD. And then the other thing you can do is if you can't reach me that way, you just go on to Amazon online bookstore, type in my name, my, all my three books are there. You can reach me that way as well. Well, Chris, man, I really appreciate it. This has been really great. I hope that whoever listens to this gets something good out of it. Now, I wanted to say something before we leave, because you were mentioning in this process, whoever gets started in it, I've started in it, and this is part of the process, and I don't know where it's going to lead eventually, but I'm, you know, one step at a time. And you mentioned that the social pressure, what are going to people think of you? People are going to hate, people are going to criticize. There's one thing that I want to say before we leave, and that's other people's perception or thoughts about you, it's their problem. It's none of your business. So if you're thinking about if you're thinking about doing any of these things, forget about what anybody's gonna say or what they think. That's their problem. And most of the time they're reflecting their own insecurities and fears on you. So exactly. you know, having said that, you know, I'm really happy that we did this and uh, maybe we should do it again sometime. I really enjoyed doing this interview with you, Raphael. All right, man. Well, we'll stay in touch and thank you all for listening. Remember to rate and review. That really helps us keep going. Share with a friend and that, tell that friend to share with a friend and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review. Also, maybe share it with a friend. Feel free to share your thoughts via email at Raphael at myfitnessride.com. And remember, Raphael is with an F. Until then, be kind to others and yourself. <laughs>